would move through the system and that the numbers coming in wouldn't be as significant as they are. As I referred to earlier, we've moved nearly 200 people through that facility. So if it was actually set up to move 101 out, it's doubled that as an achievement. The influx coming in is the difficulty. In terms of where we're at now, you know, obviously the difficulty, as I pointed out earlier, is in relation to who has um, the authority to continue that, that, that service or to sign off in terms of the use of the premises. If it was to not happen again, obviously there needs to be some more security in relation to the term of the lease, I would assume. Um, when it is a state run, uh, when it is a state owned facility, in my naivety, I would have assumed that, you know, two departments talk to each other uh, and that that's resolved if there is a need. It, it seems unusual that one department would be contributing to the numbers of rough sleepers and one department would be trying to solve it. So I don't know if that answers that element of the question. In terms of the staffing, I suppose you, you mentioned social workers. We work with people with very complex uh, mental health and medical issues right across the sector, and particularly those who are in services for longer. They are in services for longer because they are becoming the less visible. The families and those who are newly homeless are able to move out of services quicker. Those with more complex needs are stuck in services. All services, or I speak on behalf of those that I know in Dublin, so apologies, but we would have trained uh, workers who work on assessments. There's a full pathways to home model that all staff are trained in, in terms of providing holistic needs assessments and absolutely focus on exits to homelessness, where we all need additional resources in, is in terms of mental health workers because the mental health impact on people who are experiencing homelessness and who have lost their home. So there's that whole sense of grief and bereavement around losing their home and isolation and loss of their community that is very intense and we see a significant number of people taking their own lives who are in contact with our homeless services. So, but there is also, and again, in terms of our, my own organisation, CrossCare, we have seen, and I can't speak on behalf of others, we've seen a significant number of medical discharges directly into homelessness. And whilst there is a plan to implement a national discharge policy that hasn't been rolled out and is still on the Dublin Region Homes Executive Plan for implementation this year, but I know that there has been difficulties in trying to roll out that plan. But, you know, I think sometimes even in terms of talking about cases, it, it brings it home. So we have seen just unbelievable stories in terms of people being discharged from hospital. One of our services in Crosscare had a woman discharged who was told she was going to die within a couple of weeks. She came into our services with no palliative care. We had no information around how she was going to die, and our staff team found her dead. That's the fourth medical death we've had from a hospital discharge since Christmas. So in terms of that policy from the HSE, and also coming back to the point that I made earlier in terms of restoration of funding levels for the HSE, but specifically focusing on homeless services is absolute paramount because whilst our staff are trained in assessment and working pe with people out of homes, we don't have, or some services to greater or lesser extent have medical staff, but we don't have medical staff on, on our teams 24 hours. And with the people we're working with, with very complex addiction issues and mental health issues, we really require that right across the sector, I would imagine. Um, I might let someone else answer, but I might be able to come back and ask you again about the foreign nationals question. Mr, Mr. Carroll has indicated. Yeah, on that issue around pressure on staff, Deputy O'Sullivan, um, I think um, there are a number of, I think, components that can actually help staff in dealing with the vulnerabilities. Um, and it's picking up, really, uh, of where Fiona is coming from with regards to the health issues. If we could get a restoration of um, budgets back to our levels of 2010, that would allow us to actually put um, uh, investment into 
uh, primary care interventions with those most vulnerable people, which actually have um, a big, a big um, effect on our ability to be able to cope. Um, specifically, with absolutely chronic mental health issues, um, physical health issues, uh, as far as um, access to nursing, uh, district nursing. Um, fast tracking into methadone beds as well uh, for those people who, in order to st stabilise uh, drug use as well. Um, but also as well, I think we are in a situation where um, we're really very aware that the DRHE have been absolutely working their socks off in order to be able to deal with this huge influx that has come our way um, with regards to the sheer amount of people um, that are, that are that have come into homelessness, um, which has been overwhelming for, for everybody. Um, but there is a time, to, I think, to take a step back and have um, rather a, a, a more two to three year planning approach in, in regards to what are our projections over the next three years with regards to the amount of temporary accommodation um, that we have. And that an interdepartmental approach is taken in order to provide either the, the facilities or land where the temporary accommodation can be provided. The figures were given earlier on, 102 people who, who are currently sleeping and 90 people who were turned away last night from the free phone and a potential 100 coming on board. But I think we're in a situation where we need to say, based on what has happened to us in the last year, how many single people and how many families are likely to come into the system in the next year, the next two years, until housing supply can catch up. Um, and that's really important that we strategically look at what temporary accommodation is actually needed um, in the next two to three years. Thank you. Uh, Mr O'Connell. Just on the issue of complex needs, and I think it's really important, and I think most people will agree, emergency accommodation is nowhere for someone with complex needs. It should be for the shortest possible time. And where possible, and uh, this is important in terms of the housing first approach as well, we should normalise the housing offers to people as much as possible. There will be some who will need round the clock care, and that should be catered for as well. But most people who are in very, very um, high support or high-end uh, accommodation in terms of the emergency side of things, you know, it is not a normal place for someone to be. And behaviours and everything around that are exacerbated because it's a very frictitious kind of environment where you can have people from 18 to 80 with a range of different complex needs all under the same roof. And discharges from hospitals uh, to accommodation like that is not, is, not, is not appropriate really. In some cases there may be no choice. But someone should be moved out as quickly as possible. I think there is, uh, we do have, working through the, the, the HSE, the Adult Homeless uh, Integrated Team, um, and there is within the, the, the hostel support in terms of psychiatric support through the uh, community psychiatric nurses and a consultant psychologist and so forth. Uh, um, and that helps enormously in terms of uh, the approach and allowing staff to manage some of the situations when you do meet people with complex needs. But part of that as well is the training that you provide staff. We have to recognise the nature of the issues that people present with and you have to then train your staff to be able to risk assess to include them rather than exclude them and the, the better trained your staff are the better able and confident they will be to be able to uh, accommodate somebody with those type of challenging issues but the key is to moving them on as quickly as possible the difficulty is is that those with complex needs tend to be the ones who are harder to house um, but that's all the more reason why we need to get them housed as quickly as possible because they do take up a disproportionate amount of bed nights uh, in emergency shelters and that is compounding the problem in terms of rough sleeping and people be, being able to access uh, beds as a result. Thank you. Mr John, you indicated. Uh, just, I just wanted to answer the question about accountability. Um, so in talking about the, in my own organisation has experience all around the country, but in talking about the Dublin region in the first instance, um, so we have uh, the fortunate arrangement in Dublin in that the four local authorities collaborate and they collaborate with the HSC and they have one structure called the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive. And funding is scheduled through that. Uh, Multi-annual plans for all of the homeless needs in the four counties of Dublin go through that and are debated. There is a consultative forum and other government agencies feed into the development of that plan. 
And when that plan is 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 developed, um, the DRAG then choose to find specialist agencies to contract various pieces of work to. And organisations might seem like they're all in the same business, and effectively they really aren't. Um, there's a huge range of, of, of specialisations, and people will be aware of, I won't mention them by name, but ones that are specifically involved in... Um, alcohol services, ones that are involved in uh, addiction services, ones that specialise in very complex needs, some are of which would be low threshold services, ones that specialise in with young people and some services that are purely preventative, um, some that are with singles, some with families, some that are leave for people specifically leaving care, some for people leaving the criminal justice system, ones that are specifically about, for example, domestic violence or mental health or physical disability. So in the development of that plan, the DRG would look and see what competencies are there and would look to find a suitable provider in relation to that. Um, and then how it moves from there is the funder of these services principally are the local authority and the HSE. So there are service level agreements that are drawn up between um, the individual organisation and the funder. And they are very detailed and complex contracts with two uh, parts to them. Um, there is, there's very detailed uh, requirements to meet all statutory requirements of a very large range. Uh, then there are specific targets about provision of services, the outputs and outcomes from that particular service. Um, that's reviewed on a quarterly basis with each provider. Uh, there's submission of all of the information back to the individual funder in relation to that. So in terms of that service provision, that would cover that part of it. In addition to that, in terms of the provision of housing, so the state is funding the provision of housing in different parts of the country, and that comes within the Department of Housing now, and also is linked to the local authority. So where there is, in a particular county, uh, a need for, say, uh, housing that might come under a funding scheme like the Capital Assistance Scheme, applications are submitted to the local authority. The local authority review those applications, consider them against the existing housing list in that area and the needs in that area, and mark and prioritise them based on those needs. And those submissions go to the Department of Housing and they then select from those which ones to do. So uh, an individual organisation would be approved or not approved and then enter into very detailed contracts with the Department of Housing. In addition to that, we now have the Housing Agency regulatory authority that controls the work of approved housing bodies. So it has said, set you know, codes of governance, financial regulation, and there's a requirement for us to report you know, under all of those headings, as well as the, the charities, regulator, you know, the code of governance, and so on. So, and there's a real willingness and an interest in, 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 in involving ourselves against all of those levels of accountability, in addition to our own boards to whom, as employees, we're directly responsible. Thank you. Ms, Ms. O'Connor, and then... I suppose I wanted to come in after um, Aaron said something about working with people that are vulnerable. Um, just from, from our perspective in the Midwest region, and it's picking up on a couple of other points that Deputy Ryan and Deputy O'Brien made as well, just around the different interstate and emergency accommodation of the 227 people that were in Limerick and Clare hostels last year, only 11% of them went to private rented and local authority. So where are the rest of them going? Is they're, stay they're staying in hostels much longer because of their chronic need and all and that. Um, the other point I wanted to make was around the homeless budget. I think that there was a question directly asked about the budget in terms of um, how much do we think that we need, I think was the question really. Um, the European Observatory on Homelessness states that it costs €29,000 per year to keep one person in emergency accommodation. Um, and just following on from Deputy Ryan's point about what are the solutions, I suppose for us it, it is about, it's about acquisition. I think that Declan had mentioned that. Um, and we have been in the process in, in Limerick, um, Focus Ireland was awarded the highest allocation of CAS properties in the country last year. We got 44 units of accommodation. Hallelujah, we were delighted. It turned out to be 17 houses because each unit is considered a bedroom. That wasn't a hallelujah anymore. So what we've done is we still haven't delivered on those CAS properties because of bureaucracy and because it's taken so long. So it's taken 12 months in 
a serious housing crisis to, to deliver on that. So what we've done is, is in terms of a specific solution, we've come up with it's the social rental model as, a, as an option. And as I said, it costs 29,000 euros per year to keep one person in emergency accommodation. For 20,000, we've moved 10 families out of accommodation. And basically how we've done that is, is we go in and we say it started in Cork as a pilot project between the different voluntary organisations and it moved to Limerick um, and we were lucky to be funded by the local authority. Um, they saw a merit, I think, in, the, in a pilot that we, we were, that we proposed. And basically we go in as the, land, as the tenant, so we rent from the landlord directly and then we sublet. It's not rocket science either, basically. So then we're able to manage the different um, needs that the family would present to it because there's a worker dedicated to that household then and going in as, as what Fiona was saying and all that, that the, the chronic issues that people present to it need to be managed, but they can be managed from their home. Um, so and now we've we've got an extension of that funding and now we're looking at housing 18 families between Limerick and Clare over the next 12 months which is fantastic. The other thing to say is just there is a difference between the, the rural and the urban um, issues particularly I think there needs to be recognition there, there is a recognition I think that there's a homeless crisis outside of Dublin as well um, and I think that's just something that we feel very strongly about I'm sure Aaron will agree with me on this one um, when we meet as in our, our, our alliances that's what we talk about a lot do you know that we do our numbers aren't the same they're not as high um, but there's still a significant number of people in emergency accommodation families children that it's affecting them um, so what I would say just around that point was that there there is different needs ne throughout the country when it comes to, to rural, uh, urban and rural. And what you find in the rural areas is that people need to come into the urban towns, so people need to come in from Kilrosh or Kilkee, those tar parts of County Clare, into Ennis. They've only got a 12-bed hostel in Ennis, that's all they have, they've nothing else to provide them with. Um, the other thing following on from that is just domestic violence is a huge issue when it comes to um, what we discuss in our, in our homeless alliances in Limerick and Clare. In Limerick and Clare last year, in 2015, 297 families were turned away from the refuges, Adapt House and Clarehaven in, in the region because there's a lack of beds. Domestic violence is a huge issue that's affecting um, families in rural areas. Yet, it's not counted in the stats as homelessness at all. Um, and that's because of the different funding streams. So domestic violence services are funded by TUSLA and, and therefore they're not counted in our stats really when we're, we're presenting back on homeless families. And that's just something that we wanted to highlight as definitely an issue that we're facing um, in the rural areas. And also just a final point on HAP. We're finding, I don't know how you're finding it in Cork, landlords aren't signing up for HAP. There's just too much bureaucracy. There's added bureaucracy now with HAP that there wasn't there before. Um, yes, it is a solution, but it's, it's just something that's not been taken up upon really by landlords because of all the different forms and, and all that, that they have to hand in. So that's something that we're concerned about going forward. Thank you. Just before I go back, you, um, Ms Barry, you... Uh, there were two other questions that I felt I was able to come back to you on, Deputy Sullivan. Um, one was in relation to the family numbers out of homelessness, and unfortunately I didn't bring that with me, but I could have told you how many singles. So there's 413 singles in the first quarter of this year, but uh, in terms of Dublin. But this information, and they do fabulous statistics on the Dublin Region Homeless Executive website, just illustrating... The, the trends in and out of uh, homeless services and the tenancies created. But I did really want to come back to your issue of the foreign nationals. Um, and I suppose, for me, there's a number of issues, and I'm not an, an expert to be able to speak of this. There's colleagues within Crosscare who are much more familiar with this issue. But there's a number of issues in that. And I suppose, first of all, <coughs> I want to just highlight the issue of those in direct provision who have achieved refugee status, so they have status now to live in the country, and uh, uh, so in, in some ways we haven't counted those individuals who are going to require housing in, in the numbers of, you know, for the, the housing build and allocations going forward, and those individuals are also given a time frame then to access the private rented sector. I, but, uh, you know, some of those individuals then also then start accessing homeless services. They have their status, they're entitled to be here. So, as I said, I'm not an expert around that, but it's a significant issue in terms of those in direct provision. There's also those, you, you mentioned foreign nationals. I, I know that I drive my colleagues on the Dublin network demented when I keep coming back to the whole ineligible issue, uh, though I think David's along with me on this one. Um, 
There's a difference between who we call eligible for placement. So those six month placements where you can do a full assessment and assess people to exit homelessness. But the issue of people being eligible for those placements is much broader than whether or not you're a foreign national or not. So if you're from Cork and you come to Dublin, you're not eligible for a long-term placement, you stay in a one-night only system. Now if we can't get hold of you because you're going through that one-night only system, you don't then get assessed. But you are in that emergency system or potentially sleeping rough, but you're not eligible for the longer-term placement. But in that category, there's also returning Irish, there's those internal migration, as I mentioned. There's a lot of migrants who potentially can't establish the fact that they have lived in Dublin because they may have sublet or they were house sharing, but they may have worked here for a substantial length of time, for many years during the boom, but may have worked on the black market, cash in hand, so can't establish. But they also have significant language difficulties in being able to access services. We also have, um, we, we do have people who are out of status. We have a, quite a significant document that I'd be more than happy to send through to you in relation to all the different categories of status and those we deem ineligible for placement because the issues in relation to all those categories are quite, quite different in terms of their pathway out of homelessness. However, there, are all, there is also the new communities unit. Again, I'm not an expert in being able to answer those. Some of those individuals, my understanding, Dave might be able to answer it more, some of those individuals are counted on pass, but some of them are not. So we have a whole cohort of people who are also placed by the new communities unit in private emergency accommodation with no supports on site. So that's another category that I suppose, so all of those people in that category probably are quite hidden in terms of the problem. Thank you. You can come back. You did ask with Deputy O'Sullivan about hotels as well and the issue of hotels. And obviously, um, we're all aware of the huge impact that it has on individual families. We provide an in reach service into one of the hotels in Ballymun and Focus Ireland Wood and other organisations. Um, I think uh, DRHE at the moment are providing uh, funding for a case managed approach for those families. Um, but our experience is that the majority, for the majority of them, it is a supply issue. Um, some of them have complex and vulnerable needs, but most of them have housing needs. And I suppose in this um, interim situation, um, obviously the rapid housing build is key in order to be able to create enough temporary accommodation in order to do, provide an alternative to hotels. But I think whilst people are in the hotel situation as well, the type of support that they get um, is critical in order to be able to make sure that the children go to school uh, and, and, a, and a school of their location, uh, making sure that they are feeding into community interventions, making sure that children are receiving proper nutritional meals rather than taking takeaways. So, um, so that intervention of that existing cohort is critical as far as a, a coordinated strategic approach that is being taken by DRHE at the moment uh, in partnership with community interventions as well. Thank you. At this stage, as the afternoon is it's getting late in the afternoon, I'm going to take contributions from the remaining members and then I'll afford the opportunity for a reply to them, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, Deputy Canny. Be brief, uh, because some of my questions have already been raised and answered, so I won't repeat them. I just, um, two things. Um, I think uh, Trina said something about the fact that 11% of people who were in emergency accommodation actually got into private accommodation. So I think that is a problem, what's happening there. There is, from listening to you, it's so complex. And I know that, uh, Mr O'Connell, you were saying, we need to simplify things. I'm not going to ask you to go through it now, but I really would appreciate to see you maybe coming back in your own, in the next week or so, with some suggestions on how we can simplify even the HAP, um, or any other um, thing that, uh, system that we're in, because sometimes what we do is we create processes and we create box ticking exercises, but we don't actually get things done. And I was taking what you say and I agree wholeheartedly, we need to get the emergency sorted out. And just one other comment, you made the suggestion we need to increase the number of rapid build. And I would say that they're for probably permanent housing as opposed to temporary housing. 
and we need to increase the number of acquisitions. There may be a problem there in that the acquisitions may not be there where we need them, but we have to, which I, I agree with that. And I suppose, going back to what um, Deputy O'Brien was talking about, the, the uh, closing down of some of the emergency situation, I think the third thing, the suggestion you should make there, we need a rapid increase in the number of uh, bed units or whatever for the homelessness. And it is complex, and I, I, I compliment you on your work, but I think when we need to go back to simplifying it and maybe getting the avenues opened up quick, quicker. And I would appreciate if you could uh, give us something on that uh, collectively or individually, I don't mind. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Butler. Thanks, Scott. Here, look. Um, I welcome um, Trina's comment when you, when you, you said that um, this problem is not only Dublin-based, it, it's, it's rural and urban. I come from um, the constituency of Waterford, so I deal with urban and rural. Um, one of the points I'd like to make, we had NAMA in this morning, and they're going to um, provide 20,000 houses by 2020 is the plan. But what really concerned me was that 93% of these houses are going to be in the greater Dublin area and just 7% in the rest of the country. And I'm just wondering, in, in 2020, will the problem be pushed down the country as against, you know, there's a lot of issues down there as well. The other problem I would also um, like to address is, um, Mr O'Connell, you refer to it about the voids that um, they're not being turned, you know, turned over fast enough. And I was just wondering, would you comment on this? Um, last year in Waterford, uh, all, all offers by um, the local authority, 46% of first offers were turned down. And I believe the figures are quite high in Cork as well. And um, what has come up a few times um, is choice-based lettings. And I think this works quite well in Cork and Dublin. It has been um, rolled out in those areas. And, uh, you know, it's something that has come up a couple of times during in the committee and you know it might be something that would be worth looking into whether it could be rolled out throughout the country if you know it seems to work very well from what I can gather thank you very much deputy function uh, thanks chair yeah I'll be very brief as well um, there's so much I agree with what you're saying particularly in relation to HAP and landlords not taking it up and RAS and every other scheme they have no interest and they'll make up any excuse in the book but they as much as possible will avoid it I think these are some of the best submissions that we've gotten from any of the organisations because they deal with real recommendations and there's nothing in here that can't be implemented it goes back to the will to actually do it and I think that's a job of work for us as a committee the issue about the, the domestic violence and uh, particularly women who are at risk, that's a really important one because I know we have that situation in Kilkenny where we have three um, homeless facilities. One is a hotel and they're always full with a waiting list. It's not as bad, obviously, as Dublin and some of the bigger cities, but like that, there's a lot of women who present with domestic violence and then they're being maybe referred to Clamell or Waterford and they just won't take up those places because you're, you're going out of the school region, you're going out of the family setting and then they just fall into like sort of nowhere land, you know, and it takes an awful lot to say I'm going to leave this situation if you are in domestic violence and then to be presented with all this, this problem. So I think, it's, I think that's the first time that's been raised actually in this committee and I think it's good as well as the under 26s because a lot of people are being encouraged to stay at home it's not always as simple as that and you have an awful lot of people who are maybe under 26 but they're coupled they might have a child um, you know it's it's like like you're saying it's so complex but yet at the same time the solutions are actually quite straightforward the one question because most of them are just comments in, in relation to, to that but the one question I do have is in the the Cork submission about the CPO and vacant properties, I'd be really interested in a bit more detail on that because that came up a few times and when the Minister um, was in, he was saying that there's an issue around private property rights, but I do think that's something we need to look at because there are so many vacant units and you know, you know, if we were able to CPO those through some sort of a fast track mechanism and get them turned around. It's it's not only a long term, but it's a short term solution as well because they're going to be, uh, come up a lot faster than if we start building houses now. So just like maybe you don't have the information to hand, but if you could even send it on, just how you would see that working. And does that include not just derelict sites, but it does include, let's say, vacant units because everybody here would know of places in their own hometowns that. Nobody has ever lived in it seems like they've been vacant for years and that it, do you mean those as well or do you just mean kind of specific areas? Thanks. Thank, thank you Deputy. Deputy Catherine Byrne. Thanks very much Chair and just I'll be very brief too just this morning just to reflect back on what Nama said this morning I just quoted the two figures here uh, one about uh, Cork City 
and identified 500 units. 309 of them was confirmed for demand, but only 285 were delivered. So, and it's the same in Limerick as well. There was 145 identified by NAMA, 55 deemed confirmed, and only 16 of them were delivered. So there seems to be something wrong with the local authorities and placing the people into certain areas. And I think that came up this morning where some of them uh, just weren't suitable for different areas. So maybe that's something that NAMA, you could go back to NAMA, because I think it's important, it's happening in Dublin as well. I've just two comments. One about uh, people who are sick, and particularly people who have long-term illnesses who are homeless, who are homeless, and definitely something needs to be done about feeding them through um, nursing home situation. I think it's very wrong for anybody who's in the last moments of their life having to die in a hostel or die anywhere like that without being fed in through. I think that's something that the committee should definitely look at as part of the overall thing. And just on the other thing, just about the brew, because I'm very familiar with it, it's in the digital hub there, and I would certainly be recommending that to the committee that maybe we should, and I know our role isn't to, isn't to intervene in these, but we should be not closing hostels. When, when they're needed at the time we're in. And we shouldn't be closing down places that are giving a service at the moment. And I would very much be in favour of, of pursuing that with City Council, that this hostel should be left open until something else happens in its place, because it's definitely needed, and I know the demand. And I'm just on the last one, just through Merchant's Key Project, because you might have some feedback really. Just when you were talking about the medical needs of people because of the services in Merchants Key, would many of your homeless people through cross care link in with the Merchants Key project because they have doctors and nurses and dentists and all of that. And I just think they're a really good model of how we should deal with people who are homeless as well. You know. Thank you Deputy and just to say Deputy it wouldn't be a question of interfering, it's quite within the remit of this yeah, committee well, to make that if recommendation. If we could I think we so should yeah, because it's, it's not, really, really crucial at the moment that this It's not interfering, we're, you're quite entitled to make the recommendation. And finally, uh, Deputy O'Dowd. Thank you, Chairman. I uh, just want to say that I'm very impressed with what you're saying. Uh, one of the points is that the government policy is to have, I think, 75,000 uh, families or individuals um, helped through HAP housing assistance payments and so on by the year 2020. So that's an absolutely huge challenge. And from what you're saying there, it isn't being met in any respect. And I think one answer might be, and it's probably more for the government than ourselves here, but if, it is, if you tax incentivise the landlord, in other words, uh, you write off X, Y and Z of their debt in terms of the mortgage or whatever it is, uh, and if they give a tenancy for five years to the local authority or whatever, you tie the, uh, the tax advantage into the length of the lease. Uh, or, or the term of, of the occupation. I think that's one way of doing it. But we have an awful lot of work to do on that because that's the most significant aspect of the housing policy as I look at it today. The second issue I have, and again, it's a generic issue in that I've been in public life for a long time and I've dealt with housing all my life. It's never been as bad in terms of numbers. The biggest difficulty I see at the moment is how anybody who's looking for housing is actually treated by the system. And one of the problems, if you go to the local authorities, they're overrun. And certainly in my county, they're top class, but they don't have the space. They don't have the time to give to the individuals. They don't have the time to, as you say, under Section 10, you propose, I think, greater supports, which I think is absolutely critical. So the point I'd like to make is, would it make sense for you know, that, that people outside of the local authority would act as advocates for all of the applicants. In other words, that, that all of the issues that they would need to present to the local authority could be, if the applicant choose, to go through the advocate who would be a professional, full-time, paid, staffed office, separate from the local authority, but able to deal not with the physical housing need, but all of the other issues, whether it be medical or social or family. And in that context, uh, one of the biggest categories, I, the, the ones that cost me a lot of thought, are where you have men who are separated, maybe in the 40s or 50s. They may have significant alcohol problems or personality problems, but are actually thrown on the scrap heap of life. Many of them, many of them will find a bed when they're not drinking, right? But when they are, they're on the street. That's what I find. And I think we need to, we need to look at that. And part of that other problem that I see is if you have families who are on the housing list longer than anybody else, because they may have no children or because they may have only just one child, they're down the list of priority. And I'm sorry, we don't have a two-bedroom house. We'll give it to somebody. Who's there. So there's a whole load of issues there. And I think 
if in your wisdom, uh, when you go back, maybe you could help us uh, in sort of formulating, you know, a new way of, of, of treating people. Fundamental is the humanity, is the human being in all, of, in all of our works, whatever they are, but all of their goodness and everything that they are is lost at the moment because nobody's time to listen, nobody has the skills to articulate, nobody, there's no place you can go and sort out their, all of their other issues, which are huge. And the housing is purely just the, it's the tip of the iceberg, but it's only part of it all, I think. Thank you, Deputy. Just before I ask for the, the replies and responses uh, to say today that a, a range of questions were asked, and I've got to give each one of you an opportunity to respond to the ones that are relevant to your area. And particularly, as Deputy Canny was speaking, if there's further information do you think would be relevant to this committee, uh, it should be forwarded, but in a very short time frame. The committee will actually have finalised its report in a month's time. So, you know, uh, we're working quite rapidly on this process. So that, that concludes the questions, and I'll start this time at the far side of the table. Trina. Yeah, just as I'm sitting here, I suppose, the, like we're talking about people, that's what we're talking about, and I think that's, we were, myself and Declan were talking outside the door, we can get a last in the politics, bureaucracy, everything, you know, we're talking about people's lives and anybody, I'm working in homeless services since 2000, anybody that I've ever met and ever worked with, all they want is a home and a place that they can call their own. And it's our job to get them that. That's why we're here. That's why all the staff that I work with work tirelessly to get for that to happen. Sometimes it takes longer than others. Some people have a lot more issues than other people do. But that's, that's the crux of it. And I suppose when I made my submission a minute ago, I think I was trying to rush through a number of points all at the one go, because I, you know, just to get to have it said. But like, it is a great. It, in my role, I appreciate being here and the fact that I've been given the opportunity to speak on behalf of the clients that I work with. And I think that's what we need to remember, and that's why we're all here. And I know that's why you're here as well. Um, it has been said that we need to simplify the answer. The solutions are there. We just need to, to work to, to, you know, to, to make them happen sooner rather than later. And I think that can be a lot of it is that we feel as an alliance is what came up for us when we met about this meeting, that you can get caught up in the bureaucracy of something and it takes a lot longer than it needs to do for, for solutions to be found. There are solutions there. We've all made several solutions of, of things that can happen and happen fairly rapidly. Obviously there's longer term um, issues that need to be dealt with and they will be. Um, and just to say that, you know, we welcome the opportunity to be able to present to you today and appreciate the time that you've given us. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr O'Connell. Okay, just on the point about the, the, the voids and, and the offers, um, I think, I mean, we've said this before as the Social Housing Forum, that there needs to be a bit more research into why people are refusing. Uh, maybe the expectations are too high in some cases, but I, I think in many cases as well, uh, it depends on where people are offered. And the difficulty is for some people, uh, their support networks uh, need to be close to them for people to be able to manage and particularly in terms of the crisis that we've been through in many, over many years now the one thing that has kept some communities together and certainly some families was the support networks that they had those who didn't fell into homelessness or on the verge of it or were under very stressful uh, circumstances so I think sometimes th 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 there's no quick answer and th there's no kind of um, kind of one answer to those type of particular questions. But we do need to bear down on the whys and the wherefores, and I do think there's a bit more research needs to be done on that. But I do think networks are important and all of that. The other thing as well is that people's income is important as well, because you either have transport or you don't. I think that's some of the issues where people were unable to take up some of the offers and some of the options that NAMI gave across the country uh, were without, outside the transport networks of people who are on low incomes and what have you as well. So that is a determinant as to whether somebody will, will take up an offer, an offer or not. Um, I think in terms of the, the under-26s, we're, we're treating them as, as different citizens, as less than others, and that's wrong, fundamentally wrong. There needs to be a quality of offers and opportunities for everybody, and because you're young doesn't mean you should be treated any differently. I think that's a very exclusive way to deal uh, with people in exclusionary in, in real terms, and that's something that definitely has to be dealt with. They have no chance of moving out, even if options were available, because they haven't got the money to do it. You know, so I think they're fundamentally discriminated against in that level. Uh, so there's a big question there. Um, in terms of the choice-based lettings, in some of the cases in Cork in more recent times, there wasn't any offers up on the choice-based lettings because there was nothing to offer. 
so there are issues around that. So, and that's part of the problem. It's about if is there a choice, and what are the choices? And the reality is, at the moment, whether it's in local authority housing or otherwise, there are no choices because there's nothing available, and that's the problem. Um, the the CPO, just to mention about the CPOs, we have CPO'd land for roads and what have you in the past. Uh, we're in very challenging circumstances for everybody. Uh, we need to get off the fence in terms of what it is. There is a challenge between people's uh, you know, uh, rights in, in, in terms of uh, possession of um, housing and so forth. Uh, but there are things that can be got over, I think, uh, in terms of the greater common need. And I think we need to look at that in, in those circumstances. Um, but where something is not being used then it should be brought into play where it can be brought into play. Not everything will be suitable. The areas that people are in or what's on may be available may not be suitable for the particular category or, or particularly in terms of transport. Uh, so those type of things are really important. Bus routes, uh, local community facilities, pharmacy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, GP, health centres and so forth. Uh, and particularly if you're talking about families, uh, and this is important to point about the... Um, uh, the new bills and what have you, whether it's rapid or otherwise, uh, we need to be very clear here. Uh, families need to be able to get their children to school, and we need not to ghettoise people as well. Uh, and we need to stabilise people's s situations. So we, wherever we can, we should not disrupt them in terms of movement, particularly for children. It is, has a, a really a negative impact on, on, on children. So I think we need to, where possible, normalise what we can do and keep people as close as possible to their existing networks. Um, the the empty units, a difficult one, I would say, because you do you have people's rights and and, and what have you. So there is a kind of a clash here, uh, but we have to overcome those type of obstacles. I think in terms of CPO and something, if somebody is not using something, and you just have to have the right offer, I suppose in in many respects. But there is challenges in terms of being able to do it. Uh, but it is a mechanism that is there, uh, and we should look look at it. Similarly with the party aid. It will speed up the process. It means you don't have to go through everything. It's not something we would normally advocate, by the way, because I do think it's important as a community organisation uh, and, and people who work in the community that you bring the community with you. You know, But we're in very challenging times now, and everybody needs to become part of the solution. So, so the ask of communities around the country as well is to accept people in, into their communities you know, and to become part of the solution as opposed to putting more obstacles in, in the way. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, Ms. Barry. Um, I suppose I'm sitting here thinking, I would love to be sit, sitting here thinking we didn't need emergency accommodation. Um, and I think you, know, you actually did a great job of bringing it back to the people we serve and provide services for. So I suppose I'd like to thank you for your support for Brew Imshire and emergency accommodation on behalf of the residents of that service and for those who are off sleeping tonight and for the 58 people who could have been in those beds last night and tonight. So I really appreciate the support on behalf of them. I'm not sure it's DCC that you need to pursue at this stage. My understanding is that it probably is a conversation between the two ministers uh, at this point in relation to intervening. Um, I suppose I particularly appreciate your support, Deputy Byrne, given that we are in your constituency, and I'm delighted that over the past six months you haven't been ringing me for any other reasons because the support from your local community in terms and the feedback that we've had from your local community has been second to none. You did ask about links with Merchants Key and those medical facilities. Some people do link. I think the, exp the experience is that people do tend to move around services but it is a very particular niche group attend Merchants Key and obviously a lot of people don't have addiction issues and don't want to access services there. We've also seen a massive increase in people accessing our services in wheelchairs so that actually provides a real difficulty in terms of access to service so we often actually have to, we really need to provide medical services on site um, and even in terms of that mental health, sometimes people can't leave their room to, to leave a service to access medical services. We do have great support from Safety Net, particularly in terms of Brew Imshire and our other emergency facilities, in terms of the provision of medical facilities on site, but it's very limited, unfortunately, in terms of what they can provide. 
as a matter of priority, I'd be asking that the HSC hospital discharge policy is implemented as soon as possible because we need to stop seeing people being discharged into homeless services. I wanted to come back to a little bit on the vacant um, properties in terms of um, what was talked around. And I suppose, again, from a personal perspective, last year I had the unfortunate task of applying for the Fair Deal Scheme for my mother, who passed away since. But in that, there's an absolute disincentive to rent out that property. So if she was in a nursing home at this point, there was no incentive for her to rent that property out. And that property would have been vacant to this day. So I think in terms of the Fair Deal Scheme, we need to actually look to see whether or not there's a disincentive to rent out those vacant properties when people are in nursing homes. Because I think a lot of those properties are probably vacant. Also, just again, coming back to, to the residents, just want to highlight that a group of uh, residents who are known to our services made their own submission to ye um, yesterday. They got it in on time, I believe. So I know that they're very anxious to have their voices heard, and they would relish the opportunity to come to meet with you as well. But I'm sure that other organisations and people known to Homeless Services have also made their own submissions. So, but thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, um, Ms Barry. Um, Ms McLaughlin? Yeah, just a few small points, I suppose, in relation to simplifying solutions, I think was mentioned across the board, and simplifying HAP um, was mentioned also, and I, I would completely agree, I suppose, just speaking to landlords, they, as you say, the paperwork, etc. It's just a, it's a deterrent against it. But I do feel that the the aspect of the NCT as such for houses would be um, an aspect of it that should be kept because um, it's a worry that sometimes um, if an accommodation is too easy to get, it's usually of, of not of great standards and, and nobody should be living in it as such. Um, just from previous experience, and I think you mentioned in relation to the tax incentives for landlords, um, when I started working in the service, I, I was working in the Access Housing Unit where we used to find accommodation for people living in homeless services. Um, and we used to actually get landlords ringing us, offering their offering accommodation because they wanted to give something back, they wanted to do good. That is no longer the case anymore. Um, they've had such a hard time with rent supplement over the years through the administrative aspects of rents just being stopped because the tenants weren't returning paperwork, etc. So they have turned their back on rent supplement. Um, and I think in a lot of cases they, they look at HAP along the same lines. The only thing with HAP that they would see as a positive is that they get it paid fully to them every month, the, the, the contribution is, and that is that was something that we've been fighting for for years. Um, but I think the incentives have to be there to, for, to attract landlords back onto the market. Um, and the five-year leasing scheme, I think, that you mentioned with regards to local authority and tax incentives would be, um, would be very welcome, as would the um, individual... Um, on behalf of the local authority in relation to adv to advocate on people's behalf that would be a huge thing because as you say people are overloaded work, work and at the time that's needed on an individual basis with people in local authority they just don't have it um, so I think that would be a, another positive thing as well. Thank you very much um, I'll leave Mr Dunn as chairman to last uh, Mr Carroll No I'll leave it to the chair Oh yeah Okay well, just to emphasize, <laughs> okay, not to get in here, just to um, uh, uh, underline um, the issue of health and um, Deputy Byrne, not only have you got Brew, I'm sure, in your constitu constituency, but also a number of other uh, temporary accommodation. And I think you know from personal experience of the, uh, the work that goes on, but also the support of the community as well. Deputy Byrne has been absolutely second to none to support the most vulnerable people of our society. But but um, but it's to underline as well health funding. The models exist in order to intervene with people. Sundial House that you're very familiar with, 30 people with the most complex needs. What we need there is additional health resources. What what Fiona needs in Brewinshire are additional health resources to intervene directly on site. So that health intervention is critical uh, here. On, on the wider point of, of NAMA and NAMA's provision, and even if that was to come through, um, you know, where are those houses? And you know, I think there's a very simple we have no, uh, issue here. We have enough data to be able to assess how many homes do we need. 
where are those homes to be and what type of, of housing do we need and also how much support do we need in order to uh, uh, give those households in order to sustain um, th themselves as well if we want to simplify things. Thank you very much. And to conclude, uh, Mr. Don. I will be brief. <laughs> so thank you very much, Chair, and all the members of the Oireachtas here for inviting us today and listening to us and assisting us in, in so many ways. Um, so this committee is, so, is focused on two things, housing and homelessness. In terms of housing, three words, supply, supply, supply. In terms of homelessness, I would put it to you that that is a symptom of something else. Um, in my own work experience in Sofia, over half of the people that we support come with a history of the care system. So what does that mean? And I don't think that's, that's any different for others. So what that means is that if I've come to that situation, I haven't benefited from being, having a mum and dad available to me to support me both in the, the care and in the boundaries that I need. You know, as a parent of two now adult boys, we, we of course loved and cared them, but we also created some boundaries because they needed those boundaries to be able to operate successfully in life. And many of the people that these services that you're paying for here are providing homes for people, but are also providing support for people to engage effectively with society. And it's not their fault, you know, that they find themselves not having benefited in that way when they were young. And so the care plans and the professional staff we have, most of whom have level eight qualifications and master's degrees and are working for very little money on fixed pay for whatever, are actually working to teach people those skills to be able to be constructive participants in society. So I strongly believe that the effectiveness and efficiency of this investment is bringing back more than the provision of housing to people in this situation. It's helping with all those other costs in the criminal justice system, you know, in all of the other systems that exist in the, in the country. So I want to thank you for continuing to do that. I think it's very worthwhile and I think it's a very appropriate thing, you know, in this centenary of, of 1916 that focus and attention is going on, on to this issue at this time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I'd like to thank the Dublin Homeless Network, Limerick and Clare Homeless, Homeless Alliance and the Cork Social Housing Forum for appearing here this afternoon, the presentations that you made to us, and I suppose the frank and direct answers you've given us. And I suppose I speak on my own behalf and on behalf of the members here. We're very conscious that you're not here just in your own right. There's a, a myriad of organisations that are represented by you. We as public representatives, um, and certainly in my own case as a former Minister of State with responsibility for drugs, we've met many of the organisations and we genuinely appreciate the work, the commitment that we've seen, and that's on behalf of all the members uh, of this committee would have seen the work that you're associated bodies and organisations do, and it's really appreciated. And my final comment is, if there's further information in terms of anything that arose here, the clock is ticking. We would like to see it soon. But genuinely, thank you very much for your participation today and the, the supporting documentation that we received. It's much appreciated. That concludes the meeting, colleagues, for today. The meeting is now adjourned till next Tuesday at 10.30am. Thank you. <laughs>